Across the history of video games as a medium, there have been many examples of seminal releases that greatly influenced so many other developers and their work down the line. These sorts of games can range from cult classic masterpieces to completely revolutionary releases that shake the industry as a whole, mostly depending on who the developers are and their background. The release of games like Dark Souls or Half-Life 2 can create waves throughout such popular genres as action RPGs and first-person shooters because they're backed by well-established development studios or huge publishers. On the other hand, relatively smaller releases on the indie side can reach that level of immaculate genre-defining design, just at a smaller scale in terms of popularity. But when any game of this quality gains any sort of traction, there's always one certainty. Imitation will always follow. When a product so novel and interesting is brought to the market, consumers will want more, and many developers are willing to fill that demand if it means getting a cut of that success. Of all the games I've seen that inspire this phenomenon, the most interesting of them in terms of both the original product and its imitators is Fez. Over two years ago, I released my comprehensive recap and analysis of Fez, which is the most viewed video on my channel by far at the time of writing. There's plenty to talk about with this game that I won't go over here, but what is important is that it's hard to find a perfectly satisfying conclusion in this game, given how many hanging puzzles are allowed to go unsolved. In a way, the game is unfinished, both emotionally and in a more tangible way given that the game's sequel was cancelled. This incompleteness is a huge part of the game's appeal to me, but it inevitably leaves you wanting more, and so even as Fez has faded into relative obscurity in terms of games today, it has still helped to inspire many games over the years. So that's what I'd like to go over now. In terms of gameplay, Fez stands out due to just how many crazy new things the game tries, and while there hasn't been a game since that does those same things with the same level of elegance on display in Fez, there are games that take bits and pieces from the blueprints as laid out by Fez and focus on those specific aspects. And if you're looking for something to fill the void that Fez tends to leave behind, you may find something new to try by the end of this video. So let's get into that. Before getting into the games which are more so directly inspired by Fez, I thought I would give a quick mention to two games that were worked on by the people who worked on Fez, Hyperlight Drifter and Below. Hyperlight Drifter has a more noticeable connection in this sense, as the game's score was composed by Disasterpiece, who also composed for Fez. Below, on the other hand, was simply contributed to by Fez's gameplay programmer, Renaud Bedard. In a way, these two games are more similar to each other than they are to Fez, using similar top-down combat-centered gameplay styles and building worlds that players must learn about with minimal guidance from the game itself. You could argue that they both derive some aspects from Fez, but the games I want to focus on here are much clearer in their inspiration. I just wanted to mention these two because of their direct connection to Fez as a product, and because they're both quite interesting as games in their own right. But now, you can get into those more interesting examples. Fez had a trick to its marketing that helped to make it the indie success story it ended up being. It couldn't market itself with its deepest puzzles, which the game is well known for today, as those puzzles are meant to be something of a surprise hidden beneath the game's cheery surface, and also because they could very well be off-putting or daunting to a more general audience. So instead, the focus of marketing for the game was its surface-level aspects. Visuals, music, and most importantly for this section, its moment-to-moment -moment platforming gameplay. Whether it be down to a strong sense of what travels furthest and fastest on the internet, or just a lucky coincidence, Fez's main platforming gimmick fit perfectly into the marketing medium which the game found itself benefiting the most from, which was mainly Twitter. Fez is a 2D platformer with 3D elements, in that, while you always move your character along a 2D plane, you're able to switch between four different orthographically projected views of the 3D environments which your 2D character inhabits. Due to the orthographic perspective, depth along the third axis is always ignored, allowing for many unorthodox movement options. Now, even assuming you know what words like orthographic mean, that description is already very wordy and needlessly complicated. Instead, what I can do is play a few video clips, and suddenly the mechanic doesn't just make intuitive sense, but it also has a sense of elegance when in motion. This is Fez's marketing hook. And seeing as how you can fit that hook into a single GIF, that marketing became very easily digestible for anyone who had come across the game. The implementation of platforming into the game itself is a bit less elegant than this, but I'll get to that later. There are many games that play with odd perspective in the same way that Fez does, though for this section I wanted to look at one that is a bit less well known, which takes a slightly different approach, a game called 2D and Top D.
I was made aware of this game because of a Reddit post made by the developers promoting the game on the subreddit Made for Fizz. At the time of writing, it's the most upvoted post of all time on r slash fizz, which is no surprise given the stellar presentation in the attached video. The game is a visual treat, consistently colorful and expressive throughout its runtime, and the music follows that expressive trend while not being too grating to listen to on loop. You can get a good feel for the story just through looking at the story page, and even though I expected the writing and story in general to be a bit annoying, I was pleasantly surprised to find a decent bit of charm even despite its silliness in places. While all those aspects of the game are good, 2D and Top D is clearly a game that puts gameplay above all else. It's the same sort of gameplay as Fizz, and then it benefits heavily from being shown rather than told, though it's not nearly as difficult to understand in words as Fez's gimmick. You take control of two characters, one that you control with a standard platforming control scheme, and the other with a standard top-down control scheme. These two characters inhabit the same grid-based levels, and you can switch between them at will with the eventual goal of reaching the portal in each level with both characters. It's a mechanic that gets you to look at the levels from different perspectives, though rather than those being different spatial perspectives, it's more so seeing the levels through two radically different mechanical perspectives. The game is a linear level-based puzzle game, rather than a more open-ended, exploration-based one like Fez, which fits the restrictions the game places on movement that are used to build more interesting puzzles. This ties in with a piece of criticism I've heard proposed for Fez, which is that the platforming in the game is not particularly deep. The game doesn't bother to expand upon its platforming a lot, in part because there isn't much to expand upon. A good 50-60% to 60 of the rooms in the game can be boiled down to switching through the available perspectives until you find the correct one to continue, which isn't a very interesting challenge in terms of either mechanical precision or mechanical understanding. A platforming system like the one seen in Fez couldn't support a linear puzzle game like 2D and Top D, but that's why Fez is more interested in the experience of exploring its world rather than the platforming itself. The incredibly simple and non-punishing platforming fits in well within Fez's focuses, and the low ceiling of complexity is compensated for by introducing the input code puzzles, which provide plenty of complexity for the late game. But to get back on topic, I found that 2D and Top D had a suitably diverse set of puzzles for the game's length, with new concepts being introduced at a good pace. In terms of puzzle mechanics, the game definitely got more interesting as it went on, but the big issue I found with the game was that it only got more annoying to play as it went on. Most puzzlers like this game have an undo button to prevent wasting too much time redoing steps if you make one misinput, and the platforming aspect added in this game, along with a complete lack of an undo feature, makes the issue twice as bad. Because of the asynchronously moving parts of many levels, and the non-grid-based movement of the platforming mode, implementing an undo feature of any sort would be tricky, but it's still one that is sorely needed to make later levels with more sources of death less frustrating to deal with. I figure something like being able to rewind to the 4 year last character switch would be enough to make the majority of levels far less tedious. But even with that issue, 2D and Top D still scratched the itch I was interested in scratching by simply being a mechanically driven puzzler that plays with multiple perspectives in lots of fun ways. The unique way that Fez explores the strange rules of perspective in its world is probably the aspect of the game I am least attached to but it's still a very important part of the game's feel, and I'm happy to see games that take this concept and make it stand on its own in ways that Fez simply couldn't. If that's a part of Fez you really connect with, or if you're just looking for a decent, mechanically focused puzzler, I can easily recommend 2D and Top D to you. An important moment in Fez is the point at which you come across the first of the game's deeper puzzles that you can actually understand. For most people, this takes the form of the QR codes, or maybe this achievement, each of which give input sequences in plain English. It's the point at which the scope of the game within your own perception expands, and the point where you begin to consider the environments more closely and discover subtle clues you may have walked past. It's an entire recontextualization of the game world that is usually accomplished in games by a physically expanding world that recontextualizes the scale of previous areas to provide an awe-inspiring wow moment. But in Fez, it's more of a newly revealed attention to detail that shifts your perception of everything you've seen before. You may be able to guess where I'm going with this, so let's talk about Tunic. Tunic is the only game I'll talk about here which I believe wholly surpasses Fez in the key aspects I'm using to compare them. It takes the cryptic feel of Fez's mid to late game, mixed with the similarly cryptic feel and a good amount of visual inspiration from Zelda 1, to fully realize its vision, evoking aspects of both games to create its own truly unique package. 
but to only speak on the inspiration it took would be leaving out the novel, beautifully executed elements present in this game. I already wrote a review of sorts on this game as a text post, which you can read here if you want to pause, but I'd like to get a bit more in-depth because Tunic is a game that thrives on deep dives into its world and the secrets they reveal. In the beginning I'll be referring more to the influence of Zelda 1 on the game, as the clear Fez influence only comes in near the very end. So to start, for those who are interested in game design, and more specifically world design, Zelda 1 is a game that is difficult to call good in these respects, but if you have any sort of attachment to the game, it's also difficult to call it bad. It's possibly a form of nostalgia for a bygone era before widespread internet access, where secrets spread slowly through word of mouth, rather than the instant dissection games receive upon release today. Essentially, Zelda 1 has secrets that go far beyond the obscurity of what most developers would dare attempt to implement in games today, the most infamous of which are the entirely untelegraphed bombable walls that reveal items as useful as entire new heart containers or huge sums of currency. Combined with a shoddy translation from Japanese to English, Zelda 1 has an aura of mystique surrounding it, and while you can easily find extensive documentation of every secret on the internet today, Playing the game without referring to those resources is an experience that is unlike anything you'll have playing modern releases. That experience is usually one of directionless frustration, but it's still quite unique. Tunic seems to me like a modern take on Zelda 1, committed to preserving as much as possible of what made Zelda 1 special, while also maintaining a modern edge. The game plays with a refined top-down isometric combat system with a modernized defensive dodge roll lifted from Dark Souls, complete with a stamina system similar to Dark Souls as well. It's not the best I've seen this combat style done, but it's leagues better than the frustratingly archaic combat Zelda 1 has to offer. While the art style lifts from Zelda in some ways, particularly in the design of its characters and many of its enemies, there's still a great deal of originality here in many locations visited throughout the game. This is all capped off by a score, which has come to be one of my go-to soundtracks to listen to, forging a unique sound by merging the reverb-heavy synths and electronic instruments with memorable piano melodies. But Tunic's strongest connection to Zelda 1 would obviously be the design of its world and player progression and the approach it takes to both preserving and modernizing the charm of Zelda 1's world is incredibly unique. It's actually all thanks to a single inclusion, the instruction booklet. Across the game's world, you can find individual double-sided pages of an instruction booklet slash strategy guide of sorts for the game itself, and this single inclusion to the game accomplishes an incredible number of things. At a subjective level, as someone who grew up reading these official strategy guides for many different games, the guide found in Tunic exudes the same wonderful charm that those guides always had in my mind, which is only heightened by the beautiful original artwork that lines every page. But the guide also serves as a way for the game to provide information about its hidden mechanics. It's a bit of a psychological trick, because while the game itself is still telling you about these mechanics fairly bluntly, it's presented in such a way that it feels like an external source, and it still works as a reward for exploration, since you have to find the pages to read in the first place. And on top of this, the guide doesn't reveal anything more than it needs to through the use of an alternate language used for most of the text, which at the same time evokes the feeling of Zelda 1's shoddy translation into English, while still maintaining a precise intentionality in its design. I'll be getting into major spoilers starting now. If you enjoyed the mid to late game of Fizz, you owe it to yourself to play Tunic unspoiled by the following section, so skip to the next chapter or the displayed timestamp if you haven't. This video isn't called Games Like Zelda 1, so let's get on to the part I've been leading up to. A few pages out of the guide contain both subtle and not-so-subtle guidance towards discovering the game's true ending. These pages reveal an input code system, in many ways similar to the one found in Fizz, though for this game it's solely based on D-pad inputs since the D-pad isn't used for any other actions in the game. Finding and deciphering these puzzles lets you free these fairies across the world and complete the guide, which then allows for the true ending to take place. Fez has a few great examples of hiding its input codes in the environment, but a good amount of them are just simple lines of tetraminos that are easily noticeable. This is not the case in Tunic, as all but a few introductory codes used to acclimate the player are very cleverly baked into the environment. You might find a few unsectioned off fields of flowers that you have to find a connective path through, or you might find some on the pattern of a carpet or the tiling of a floor. 
Some of my favorites include tracing a code through the moss jutting out from the cracks in this wall, or climbing this room clearly inspired by the bell tower from Fez, and finding a code in the path taken to reach the top. There are even more difficult examples than that though, like a code revealed by the invisible path in this room, or one hiding in the pattern of this projected light source that you need to read while it's constantly rotating. And of course, there's the final puzzle to open the door at the top of the mountain that requires you to visually compile individual pages from a book together into the longest code present in the game, which is so satisfying to complete. To get the true ending, you only need to find 10 out of the 20 fairy puzzles, but as a deeper community project, there are even more difficult puzzles that fill up a secret treasure room on top of the already tricky additional fairy puzzles, fully expanding upon the possibilities the system provides. This is the way in which Tunic surpasses Fez, in my opinion, as the ingenuity with which these puzzles are hidden within the environments is a spectacle to see unfold in the last few hours of the game. It's a spectacle in terms of just how much your perception of the world changes throughout the game, as well as the level of thought that clearly went into constructing the world in these intricate ways in the first place. While that spectacle was present in Fez, Tunic runs with the idea and surpasses Fez when it comes to this niche experience. This, on top of all the other aspects it nails, is why Tunic is such an amazing experience and an exceptional game altogether. When you start to get deep into the design of Fez, one of the most striking things about it is the way its world is designed. The game overall is designed as a self-directed, ludonarratively driven adventure, which allows for some incredible moments, like the Rosetta Stone puzzle and a few narratively driven moments, like the reveal of the City of Zoo replica. From a gameplay perspective, the world is set up as a heavily streamlined collectathon, which leads the player deeper in a very natural way, from simple discoveries to more complex ones, eventually leading to the barely solvable and the unsolvable. The pacing of how these layers are peeled back in Fez is something that I've warmed up to in the years since my first video on the game. If the pace was any faster, it would require compromises and puzzle difficulty, and if it was any slower it would end up being boring at best and frustrating at worst. This style of world design and the path of player discovery is something that other games don't seem to try all that often, but a great example of this sort of design being done well comes from a game you might not have heard of, called the Moonstone Equation. I'd like to start by saying that the Moonstone Equation is the most obscure game I've discussed on this channel. At the time of writing, this game has a total of 18 Steam reviews. So as I said before, you've probably never heard of this game. It has been referenced on r slash Fez as a game that is like Fez, which is where I heard of it in the first place. But aside from that, this game is very obscure in the grand scheme of things. It's understandable why this is, not just because it's a self-published indie game that didn't have much of a marketing push, but also because the game itself is decently rough around the edges. The dialogue system is confusing, both control-wise and also due to spelling errors that are frequent enough to become somewhat commonplace in the writing. The design of the world is annoying in places, and if you accidentally take the wrong one-way route in certain areas, you'll have to loop back around the entire game world to get where you actually want to be. The game has a similar problem to 2D and Top D, in that there's only an option to reset the current room rather than implementing an undo function, though it's less egregious in this game due to the lack of any death state. While most of the game's puzzle rooms are fun to figure out, there's one in particular that's a giant time-wasting underwater maze, and I have no clue why this was included in the game. But when I went into the Moonstone Equation, I wasn't expecting a perfectly streamlined experience. In fact, I was expecting the opposite. I anticipated that the game would have these awkward bits and odd design choices, but what I expected the game to do well was simply providing a freely explorable puzzle sandbox that drives intrigue to see the rest of the game. There's a fine line to be walked in games like this, and how much information is explicitly told to the player in balance with how difficult the puzzles and how obscure exploration-based discoveries are, and in my experience, the Moonstone Equation walks this line near flawlessly. Every step taken towards unraveling the mystery is silently established and hinted at just enough to make them reasonable to discover, while still maintaining a sense of achievement for that discovery, and the more linear puzzles offered as rewards for those discoveries are almost always enjoyable. In the later stages of the game, there's another very unique layer of non-linear discovery, as some secrets can be activated in multiple locations, with these puzzles acting as an elegant marriage of the game's mechanically based puzzle rooms and the ludonarratively driven exploration. Because of this game's relative obscurity, I'm trying to be somewhat vague with my descriptions, so as to not spoil things. If you enjoyed Fez for its freely explorable, ludonarratively driven world and the sense of discovery that structure allows for, 
the Moonstone Equation is a must-play, especially if you can put up with some of its aforementioned odd design choices. You should go play this game right now if that sounds like you, but if you're still unconvinced, I'll dip into spoilers a bit to mention what may be the most exceptional part of this game. While the game's writing on its surface is not great from a technical perspective, the Moonstone Equation has one more important connection to Fez, which has to do with its narrative. After moving through the linear puzzles in the Moon Lab, your reward is the introduction of an entire alternate language created for the game, sentences of which you can find scattered around the game's larger puzzle rooms and elsewhere. An entire deeper layer is hidden beneath the already deep discoveries to be made in this world that can potentially add hours of enjoyment for those with the right mind for these sort of things. And while I personally didn't get any deeper than simply reaching the ending, there's so much more to be found in this world if you feel so inclined. And if that sounds interesting to you, there probably aren't many games that will satisfy this specific itch, so you shouldn't miss out on this one. The Moonstone Equation is absolutely a niche title made for very specific people, but for those specific people, it is absolutely worth their time. Fez is a game that was far ahead of its time, combining all three aspects I've discussed here into a game which communicates a particular message with a strong sense of clarity. It's taken years for developers to capture even just parts of Fez which made it special, and to my knowledge there is yet to be a game which fully captures its magic, though I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. The game has already accomplished its goals in as close to a flawless way as I believe is possible, and I don't think it's necessary for that magic to be recaptured. If anything, that hypothetical game may just look like a simple imitation in comparison, but in capturing only specific parts of what made Fez exceptional, these three games, and many others, have focused and refined those parts in their own unique ways, in some cases more effectively than Fez itself. With how good the games born from this trend have been, I can't wait to get around to some of these games I've missed, and similarly, I can't wait for those that may come in the future.